Welcome to the Soul Seeker Podcast. I'm your host, Sam Kabert, and this year marks the fifth birthday of the Soul Seeker Podcast. I started this pod back in 2019 when I was taking my first steps on the path of remembering. And at the time, the tagline for the show was a journey of self discovery. A year later, it became a journey of remembering. Yet, what I know now is back then I was still seeking. And what I've come to know now is that it's the journey of seeking that brings us the silent, slow stillness of acceptance. And therein lies our own innate wisdom. It's my mission now to eradicate the glorification of hustle culture, as it was my drive in entrepreneurship that led to a greater whole. And that's because I was outsourcing my sovereignty rather than looking within. So let this be your invitation to take a deep breath in and remember that at any time we can shift our thoughts and our feelings to create the outer world in which we wish to live. Soul Seekers, it's time to grow. Let's go. Super excited to sit down with Jason here and talk about his journey because there's a lot of parallels in our journey. But as always, before we get started, let's just ground with a few breaths. So Jason, for you and I, we can close our eyes and start to shift from the outer world into the inner world. And for all of you listening, I would just recommend to breathe with us. You know, sometimes uh, you might not be in a space to close your eyes, but you can always breathe. So let's go ahead and close down the eyes, just feeling the feet on the floor, sitting up straight, drawing our awareness to that space between our eyebrows, and through the nose, finding an inhale all the way up, sipping in a bit more air at the top, through the mouth, sighing it out. <sighs> Through the nose, inhaling up as you let the belly expand and bring that breath all the way up. Sipping in a bit more air at the top. And through the mouth, exhale. Oh. One last one, biggest breath yet. Inhaling all the way up. Sipping in a bit more air at the top. Holding the breath, just gently rolling the eyes up and continuing to hold the breath here. And exhale, let it go. Flickering the eyes back open. And here we are with Jason. You know, I meant to ask and I always ask, so I am off on this one but your last name it's pronounced amarante is that right amarante that would be yeah the english pronunciation and then in portuguese we pronounce it amarante amarante was yeah. that right yeah so that's me being unprofessional not asking you before but it is all good dude i am so stoked to sit down and record with you here i mean you and i connected a few months ago through linkedin we had a really good uh, phone conversation. You sent me a podcast you were on, loved hearing your journey a little bit more Then you made an intro to those uh, folks. And I had a great show there, but for everyone listening that um, isn't familiar with like who you are and your story, can you just tell us a little bit, just a high level overview in terms of um, where you're at in your career in relation to spirituality? Ooh, okay. High level. Um, yeah, the broad strokes. Let's see, just a bit of background on myself. As mentioned, my name is Jason Amarante. Um, I grew up here in the Santa Clara, San Jose area of California, uh, smack dab here in Silicon Valley. Uh, my parents are both immigrants from Portugal, from the Azores Islands. So nine isolated islands in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and that immigrant story very much informs you know, my childhood and my upbringing and a lot of the values that crystallized as I was a child. We can we can dig into those in a bit. Um, grew up in the Bay Area, spent time in Portugal as well, sort of exposed to the lifestyle and the culture and the traditions traditions there. 
We're very much engaged in the community. Uh, went to school here, studied, did undergrad down in San Diego, grad school back up here in San Jose, and then jumped into the tech industry um, maybe 13, 14 years ago and have been at Google and YouTube ever since. I've done a whole variety of things within the company, um, program managing in different product areas from Android to Chrome and Chromecast, uh, the Google Assistant, working in globalization, and then most recently, the last few years, working uh, in YouTube on our music application. So I have like a whole history and backstory with music as well, um, and experiences in LA working in the music industry as well before tech. Um, as far You're as at War Warner Bros too, right? Yeah, was at Warner Chapel uh, publishing, doing uh, TV film, uh, sync licensing for a bit there as well. And it's not um, all that's cracked up to be, right? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's its own thing, right? I mean, that a boyhood dream to break into the music industry, very much uh, worked really hard uh, to get into LA, to do the internships, all the things uh, to break into the industry. And then sort of found out that, you know, something was missing there and ultimately prompted me to move back to the Bay Area to reconnect with family and friends and, and to feel a little more grounded. Um, Got it. As far as spirit, spirituality goes, and, and I know we're gonna like, you know, get into long form on this, um, but really the impetus for my own spiritual awakening, awakening and journey really started back in 2021. Now I was raised religious in the Catholic church, very much went through all of the steps there uh, in solidifying like my status within the Catholic religion. And it, and it really drove me a, as a youngster. I think when I moved away to college, I got a bit away from the religion, maybe a little of disillusion with some of the dogma and some of the institution um, and felt a little bit lost or disconnected to myself and to, to religion and spirituality, I'd say for a good chunk of years there. Um, ultimately, you know, got married, started a family, had three kids, uh, with my beautiful wife, Lisa. And three is a lot. How, how old are they right now? Three is a lot. Um, yeah. these company men, uh, we've got an eight year old daughter, Aaliyah, uh, six-year-old son, Cassius, and a five-year-old daughter, Simone. Um, right. nice. And, you know, all throughout that process of starting a family, very much working extremely hard, chasing all the things, all the shiny objects. And back in 2021, uh, sort of hit this, this wall. Uh, I know now that that was a major moment of burnout uh, physically and mentally, but it was also like, the starting point of this, as I mentioned, spiritual awakening. Um, and so from 2021 until now, it's been very much leaning into uh, that awakening, that spirituality, that deeper connection with myself. And through that, a deeper connection with others and with nature and with God, um, which is very much like a major theme in my life and, and governs a lot of what I do today. Um, so yeah, I'll pause there. I know we're going to dig into all that, but yeah, spirituality, very much a key component of, of life now, one that I'm grateful for and one that I think brought you and I together in being able to speak in this way with this, with this new vocabulary that I've sort of built up over the last few years. 100. Yeah, I, I have a very similar story uh, being in Silicon Valley. Also, I use the word chasing success. I now uh, think about it more as a pursuit as opposed to chase. Does that resonate with you? Kind of the energetic charge on a subconscious level of the word chasing? Yeah, yeah, it was the pursuit. That does resonate. Um, and, and I do think, you know, the years that I have spent here working in tech where, where we are incentivized um, to pursue um, accomplishment, to pursue, you know, everything is sort of oriented around, you know, how many product launches did you achieve this year? What was the reach in terms of global usage and number of users? Everything is very quantitative and justifying your existence in a quantitative sense. External, um, like validation and destination type things, right? External um, and destination, like sort of, yeah, that is 
the end all be all. Mm. And and I look back now, like I can sort of like take a look from 30,000 foot and see that, hey, you know, a lot of what I was doing as a kid and how I was being programmed and sort of what I was being encouraged to do was leading me into that, into the tech industry and leading me to a place where I was and have been successful in tech. But it's all, it's a very long story of, yeah, you know, work ethic to the, to the immigrant story is everything. And sort of having that infused into me from an early age, it's all about work ethic. It's all about being in service of others, of your community, of rolling up the sleeves um, that translated into, you know, the pursuit of success academically and then the pursuit of success professionally, where you, I truly felt like not only do I need to accomplish and accomplish more and do more, but there was this like expectation on myself that I inherited and internalized where I felt like I also needed to do all of those things as perfectly as possible. And as you, as you probably know, like that can be taxing. There's wear and tear on, on the mind, the body, the spirit, when you're in pursuit of this ideal of perfection, which doesn't exist, is not achievable, isn't a healthy target to, to live with. And the last few years, my, that spiritual journey has also been this process of unlearning and shedding Mm -hmm. that need that self-expectation to be perfect and to achieve more so yeah, yeah I, I, I definitely want to unpack the burnout but just to um address the pursuit piece a little bit more uh for me now i feel it's a pursuit uh back then it felt like a chase and it, it's been interesting and maybe this resonates with you i probably will i'm sure it will with a lot of people listening as well but when we go through this journey of awakening and we're like an executive or business professional or high performer high achiever whatever these labels you want to use someone who gets shit done straight up right if yeah. you're someone like that and then you're like oh wow i've been so focused on the doing i'm lost for my inner world and i need to work on being it's almost like we go into the being energy the feminine the yin energy so much so that we become resistant to goal setting and i know for me it, it took a couple of years i mean honestly i'm still figuring it out um it's year five i would say of trying to figure out how i approach goals now because back then i wrote my first three books in a year one of them was called the written goal it was all about goal setting and i remember like year two or so being like intentionally into spirituality like not setting any goals going on the opposite side and just intention setting and then when I did my yoga teacher training, you may have heard me say this before. I'm sure some of the listeners have. But um, Dakota Shea, m one of my yoga instructors, said he was teaching us the philosophy of sadhana, which is to be in pursuit of. It's about being in the journey as opposed to focusing on the end destination. And we can do that through the prioritization of our daily habits of who we are becoming. So what he said, the mic drop, was to name your ultimate potential – is to limit your ultimate potential. And when he said that, like in that moment, I realized, holy shit, like I've been naming my ultimate potential is like being named Silicon Valley's 40 under 40 list, writing these books, uh, uh, building a million dollar company, all of that. And just like it hit with me. So ever since then, I've kind of adopted more like I, I'm now like in the pursuit of my ultimate potential without naming it whereas when i was chasing goals it was on a subconscious level saying when i achieve abc i will feel xyz and just like hamster on a wheel chasing this this the care on a stick you know yeah oh man so much of that resonates with me and thank you for sharing that um i too okay if the first three quarters of my story was sort of blindly chasing um, with a lack of self-awareness, very much in that doing, accomplishing energy, right? In the yang. Um, and then the last few years were sort of an overcorrection, maybe. Like the pendulum swung completely to 
the yin side, the let me drop into process, let me drop into the feminine energy, let me drop into learning and understanding and accepting. Um, and like you, sort of feeling pushback or like adverse to goal setting, like to the point where, you know, if my wife wanted to make a plan that was like a week or two out, I would say, you know, I really just want to focus on today, sweetheart. Like, I don't totally. really want, I don't want to put anything on the calendar for two weeks or two months or next year. Like, let, can, can, can I just stay in this moment? Which as you can imagine, obviously there's some healthy tension that occurs that as a result of trying to force my new paradigm on everyone else around me who may not be operating at the same wavelength. Okay, so if there was the over correction in the swinging of the pendulum, the beauty is that I now find myself just now in the last few weeks, few months, finding a place where I can hold space for both. Because for me, now there's this, there's this meta acceptance and understanding that I am both of those energies. I am both being, and also there is a part of me that in this lifetime um, truly enjoys uh, and, and get satisfaction out of doing, doing for myself, doing for others as well. So it's been this integration of, yes, I can be about process. Yes, I don't have to attach my own self-identity, self-worth, self-value to the accomplishment. And yet, hey man, I've got a second half of this story where I can write an incredible story and part of that will be doing for myself and doing for humanity and doing for my friends and my community and my family and my neighborhood. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been beautiful kind of, it sounds like you're also figuring out and sorting like, how do you make it all jive through reframe and through changing your relationship and identification of self with these things, but also making space for all of those energies because we are, you know, the full mm -hmm. complex spectrum of this whole thing, right? Yeah, and this is a, a perfect a segue, just a natural segue into uh, burnout, because what we're talking about here is my message of soul life balance, which is the blending of the being and the doing. And mm -hmm. when we look at work life balance, I mean, I remember being in high school, just growing up, being in high school, being like, when I grow up, I want work life balance, whatever that is, I want that I want to be able to do the things that I want to do when I want to do it. And when I built my company up to a seven figure business, I was working less than four hours a day. So I had work life balance, but that was also when I hit that numbing depression and my spiritual awakening started. And what I realized was work life balance is all about the yang energy, the doing. So the soul life balance is the reprioritization, putting work under the life category and the soul being the being part. So I'm curious for you what that burnout actually looked like because a lot a lot of us on the outside hearing like you being at google and youtube and in silicon valley not working like remote in the middle of the country like actually out there in mountain view probably or around you know whatever and having all the different things that they do so that you can have the ultimate work-life balance like what did that burnout actually look like for you in 21 yeah um okay so let me describe, um, because I understand it may look and feel different for different folks, but I can tell you that there were likely warning signs for some time um, that burnout was coming, but that I wasn't um, paying enough attention to. And what I mean there is, you know, we've all been, a, many of us, certainly those of us who have worked in tech have been in a place where we're burning the midnight oil, um, we're putting in the hours, we're putting in energy and effort and attention. We are um, multitasking. Um, we're giving, giving, giving in the pursuit of some objective or goal uh, that be, we're being rewarded for. Um, and and that, that carrot can be enticing. And now having done that for years upon years upon years, um, there would be times, and this is all before the major burnout episode, but there would be times where I would kind of, you know, shortchange myself with respect to sleep, wouldn't really take care of myself in terms of nutrition or exercise and really like dug in all the way on the work thing because I was chasing a promotion or 
uh, a bump in salary or whatever it was, or a product launch. And inevitably, I would, you know, get little headaches, little things, right? Headaches, sometimes my hearing would sort of get foggy and go in and out. You'd have brain fog and stuff like that, but I'd kind of shake it off and like push through. All right. Now you do that for a matter of weeks, months, years, your body's sort of whispering to you, Hey, you got to pay attention to me. You're not taking care of yourself. And if you don't listen to the whisper, it becomes a yell. And for me, it was early 2021, you know, we're sort of in the thick of pandemic and working from home and, and balancing all that. Um, and I started to get chest pains and these are like real physical chest pains where I thought there's something seriously wrong with me. I stopped everything. Um, went to see the doctor. It, oh, oh, sorry, yeah. real quick. Cause I've been hearing this a lot recently from clients. Um, <laughs> is this like a panic attack or anxiety? Uh, would you say? So now looking back, okay. So the interesting thing is I'm going to answer that question right now because it ended up being something related to stress and anxiety and panic. But the way it manifests, right, for the folks who've had them, you understand, like, your pulse starts to race, and you start to feel chest pains, and you start to get that tunnel vision, maybe it's accompanied by a cold sweat. It very much mirrors, like, symptoms of, like, a heart attack or an, a cardiovascular issue. And so through a series of tests, repeated tests, we couldn't find anything. And I kept having these recurring episodes a couple of times, even calling, you know, the, the, the fire department to the house because I swore something was, wow. was seriously happening. And my wife stood by me through all that. Anyway, we go through a few weeks of this and my doctor finally opens a question like, hey, have you considered that this might be stress related? And it was like a light bulb went off in my head. I was like, you know, doc, I didn't, I, I wasn't even aware that I was stressed. But it was at that moment that I started to open up to maybe this is something that's sort of occurring from the, the mental, physical, spiritual connection. And my body is just exhibiting these painful sensations to get me to stop what I was doing and to pay attention. And it was at that time that I started to work with a therapist. And for the first time in my life, you know, you're talking about at age 40, for the first time in my in my life, starting to talk about my life and my experiences and my, and my history and traumatic experiences and things that maybe my body was holding on to and starting to unpack that stuff. So that was track one. And still, my my motivation at that time was, how do I get this physical pain to stop? And that was my only motivation. How can I get this to stop so that I can get back to doing what I was doing? All right. And While just I'm, to yeah. paint the picture too, uh, your youngest was probably what, two years old around the time? Yeah. Yeah. So you had, you had three kids, uh, a full-time job at YouTube um, and were fresh in the pandemic. Was this like mid 21? This was Feb. This was February of 2021. Yeah. So in the thick of it. All young. They're at home in the thick of it. You're trying to hold it together. Work is a challenge. We had just bought, purchased our first home. Uh, I had, you know, members of the family that were having health issues. I had a grandfather who helped raise me, who was a hero of mine, who had just passed. Like it was a culmination of so many things. And I was trying to be everything for everyone and mm. really putting myself in the backseat. That's um, such a big thing to highlight the, right there, being everything to everyone. I learned that lesson from a business perspective um, when I launched my first business in college. And mm -hmm. uh, and it's a lesson that keeps on giving, you know, and I, I really want to highlight that for people, what you just said about um, trying to be everything to everyone. So thank you for bringing that. Please continue. Yeah. Um, so I start working with a therapist which was wonderful. Um, I decided, you know, my doctor and I, we decided, hey, you probably should take some time off work because your body's telling you, you need to take a, a beat. And so I took uh, a medical related leave at that time. Um, I think it ended up lasting six weeks. And during that six weeks, I sort of cut off the outside world. Like I was very much here with my wife and the kids 
but there were a lot of things that I stopped doing outside. And it kind of worked out because it was pandemic anyway, and things were sort of quieting down. Um, but I started to spend my time sort of sitting uh, in solitude, um, sitting in silence, uh, spending time in my backyard. We've got a huge Italian stone pine tree that has an incredible energy. I started to pay attention to the tree and the plant life and, and the movement of the sun and the, and the moon as well things that I never really paid attention to. And I started to like almost hear like a different sort of inner voice. Um, and it was telling me things about myself. And it was a conversation that was long overdue. And, and so I started to explore more deeply, right? I'm like, what's happening here? You know, I, I'm, I'm jumping on YouTube. And, and at that time, the algorithm was sort of serving me up, you know, through my searches, you know, I started to encounter things like Qigong. Um, I started to do acupuncture. I started to read on more Eastern philosophies uh, around spirituality, um, Taoism and Buddhism. And it just opened up a whole nother world, uh, a, a different type of understanding of the way of things. Um, and it gave me some vocabulary that I didn't have before. And through the Qigong and the meditation and the therapy um, and the journaling and the long walks and the, and, and the introspection with self, um, I started to feel a deeper connection with myself. And then that started to grow into this deeper connection with the only way to describe it is with all that is, all that has been, all that will be. Um, and now looking back, it was it was really challenging in the moment. Um, Sam, like there were some hard days in there. Like, like I'm telling you, like I, I retreated into myself and it very much felt like putting myself in a cocoon. And that lasted weeks, that lasted months. And it alienated some of my friends and some of my family because I mean, they could see that I was struggling and in pain and yet there was really nothing that they, that I felt they could offer me at that time. It very much felt like something I needed to go through on my own and sort of, I did put walls up and, and barriers up to kind of protect myself as I was going through what felt like something really monumental and like, a huge shift, a huge transformation, um, a different orientation towards myself, my relationship to my family, to work. Um, and, and that led me then, you know, as, as this thing is unfolding, you know, the algorithms then served up, you know, stuff like breath work and, and, and Wim Hof, who you and whom you and I have spoken about a little bit offline. Um, and the power of cold immersion uh, and, and the healing power of connecting with one's breath. And this, those things became my North stars. Like those were my anchors. Like these are the things that are helping me get through each day. And because I was like going really hard on those things, then it was like less time for family. And thankfully, you know, I kind of worked through the deepest, darkest trenches of that and started to feel better slowly over time because of all of these things that I was doing for myself to soothe the nervous system, which allowed me again to have those deeper conversations with self, with God, to then have conversations with people close to me where I was able to express myself in a whole different way, express acceptance, express forgiveness, uh, which included forgiveness of myself as well for things that I had done towards others. So there was just so much healing wrapped up in this time period, which I look at now as it was a metamorphosis. And that cocoon that I was in was protecting me as I was shifting. And then, you know, not to be cliche, but I very much felt like butterfly-esque coming out of that with like a completely different view of life and myself and my relationship to the things that I once thought were important. Um, but I'll pause there because a lot of things sort of 
you know, threads came out of there and, and, and a lot of different paths and journeys and side quests. Um, for sure. Yeah, I'm wondering if any of that resonates with you as well, because I know you've sort of walked your own path too. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I saw a post from a friend this morning. She just finished her yoga teacher training and she posted something about like, she's never going to have a dark night of soul again and no time for, you know, complaining and blah, blah, blah. And uh, all this, I'm like, that is awesome. Go you. And then also thinking like, and it's cyclical. And then hearing that thought in my voice and be like, but is that a story? Is that a story that I'm hanging on to? Because my my belief is that, you know, there's all these different terms. And I've had some interesting conversations about like a dark night of the soul compared to a depressive type um, episode or series, whatever you want to call it. Uh, death portal, all these different terms. I typically use dark night of the soul. Um and I think there is a difference between a uh, dark night of the soul period versus like a depression type period. And I do believe at least where I'm at right now, that dark night of the souls are cyclical and uh, all of these heavier periods. And what I found is that going through this and learning how to surrender to it, as you put it like nervous system regulation through breath work and cold immersion, for me as well has been probably the most impactful thing to surrender to it. So now when it comes up again, I'm like, Oh, Hey there, darkness, old friend, you know, like here we are again. Right. And being like, okay, now I have a couple options here and sometimes I need to numb myself. Sometimes I need to numb myself and distract myself. And I know that I'm doing it temporarily and I'm releasing guilt and shame around it. And then when I'm able to address it, I will. But where I'm at now is adopting a game time mentality. Yes, I still will numb myself consciously and intentionally for a few days. And sometimes those few days last longer than a few days. And I do my best to adopt a game time mentality. And the way I think about it is like unleashing the beast within. You know, and that beast is going to look different for everyone. And for me, that beast is not watching TV at night because that's numbing and distracting myself. That's not emotionally and binge eating with food that's not serving me. That's working out and getting in my body and cold immersion. You know, mm -hmm. uh, just yesterday, I'll share this story with you and the listeners. I did a little bit of a larger microdose of mushrooms because um, I had the time and space for it and just be like, I'm going to dive into some stuff. And every time I do mushrooms, I just get so much weight, a, a bit massive wave of anxiety. And it's not chest pains. It feels more like I can't breathe. So at the beach, when I was meditating and doing some breath work, I just felt it in my chest. And I was just, ah, ah, just like letting it out. I was like, oh, it feels so good. And then by the time I went to the gym and did the cold immersion, oh, man, like that was one of the best cold plunges I've done in so long and I just can't speak highly enough about cold immersion. So with all of that, I think this is a good time for us to talk about your experience with the Iceman himself, Wim Hof. Tell us about uh, your journey with Wim. Uh, and thank you for sharing that as well. Um, yeah, let's talk Wim. Um, I do want to double click later on on the cyclical nature of things as well, because that has been a major learning for me as well and just sort of connecting to the natural world and the seasonal changes and looking at the 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 similarities in my own life to sort of the changing of the seasons uh but wim hof okay um so in the middle of that dark night of the soul that that really heavy heavy period which as i mentioned like initially my motivation was make this pain stop and go away so I can get back to myself and my life before. And through that initial dark night process and sort of several false dawns and then, you know. Mm -hmm. That's a good way to put it. And, and you know, and, and we're, we're, we're constantly growing, you know, going through it and growing through it, right? But along the way, I stopped trying to 
make the pain stop and get back to something and then surrender to this river is taking me somewhere. And I don't know where it's going, but I just need to trust in it and that I'm going to be okay. And it's amazing where that river takes you. Um, I came across a Wim Hof video on YouTube and it's one of these things where it, it might've been a short documentary piece. I don't know if it was Yes Theory or Vice Media. Somebody was following Wim around. I had never heard of him, but he had already been famous in some circles. Um, Wim Hof, the Iceman, uh, a Dutch adventurer who, you know, has done a whole lot for breath work and cold immersion, um, also holds several Guinness World Records. He's done a lot of really intense things. Um, and his whole thesis is like, you know, we are capable of so much more than we realize. And if we can tap into something deeper in ourselves, we can regulate core body temperature, we can, we can release trauma, we can heal ourselves, we can, we can actually uh, direct or control autonomic systems within the body that we previously thought weren't possible. So I'm watching this video and Wim is just like a very eccentric, unique individual, very authentic. Uh, and I just sensed something in him that spoke to me. I think it reminded me of my dad and some of my uncles and the, and the way that they're just rough around the edges, but in just a beautiful way. Um, and this whole, Wim's whole story is incredible as well. But as I'm watching these videos and these guys are doing this hike up a mountain in board shorts uh, and they're jumping off a waterfall into this icy river, I kept, I saw myself there and there was this knowingness inside. And, and I remember telling my wife this, but there was a knowingness like, I'm going to be there one day. I'm going to be those guys jumping in that water with a whim. And it scared the shit out of me on the one hand, but it energized me, like invigorated me in a way, like it was the good kind of nerves. Um, and so, you know, a few months passed and it might've been one year later, uh, that uh, an opportunity came where I got to join a winter expedition out in Poland. So in the mountains there in Western Poland, in the middle of winter, Wim Hof opened up a winter expedition, signed up. How cold, how cold is it out there then? It was cold, man. It's like everything was blanketed in thick snow. There's ice yeah. in the rivers. It's it's proper cold, man. I mean, I live here. Oh, in I've seen the videos for, for people listening. Like these videos, like Jason said, they're in their board shorts. They're in their underwear, no yeah. t-shirt, uh, but wearing shoes or barefoot. I don't remember. So we're going, okay. There were, there were hikes and things that we would do barefoot yeah. in the snow. I uh, thought so. <laughs> a big hike up the mountain. That was like several hours. We did wear boots that day because it was going to be a full day of hiking and being in the cold. Um, but that day was just shorts and the end boots. But there were other times where we were doing sacred circles uh, barefoot. We were going into um, the icy rivers. And this is, I mean, it's frozen on top. We're moving ice out of the way. So, wow. you know, zero degrees Celsius, 33 degrees Fahrenheit. However, what I learned there is if water is in movement, if water is in motion, it can actually get colder than freezing. So if the top is frozen and the water is flowing underneath, it can actually drop colder than that. Um, this was by far the coldest thing I've ever experienced. I did a few ice, ice, ice baths a couple of weeks before the trip. Just I'm like, I should know what this feels like before I go. Those were cold and those were challenging um, and they were tough but it was nothing like the temperatures that I encountered there. And you um, warm up after the ice baths out here. Yeah. Most of the time when people are doing a cold plunge or an ice bath, like, yes, you should not warm up right away. Let the body regulate for a minute or two, or maybe a few minutes, but we're, we're either stepping into a hot tub, a sauna, a steam room or a towel or something and putting uh, warm clothes on, you know? Yeah. Yes. To all that man. like, it, nothing prepared me over there. Like we're, right. we're, we're stripping down from like winter gear and gloves and beanies and hiking boots, like, and multi layers. 
that's how cold you're stripping down from that to nothing. You know, you've got your, you like you said, your swim trunks on or your underwear, like, and we're going into the water and I'll tell you, okay, it was the most incredible, most profound week of my entire life. And I've had moments that are like imprinted on me, you know, the birth of my children, but for like a full week long period where you felt like your energy was elevated for the entire week and you were completely connected to yourself and to your cohort and to mother nature, I've had nothing before or since like that week there. And it was the landscape, it was Wim's energy, it, were, it was the instructors whom Wim have trained. Um, and it was the programming because each day like we were all cohabitating together. We were staying in, in this beautiful little inn together and we were around each other throughout the entire day. We were eating, sharing food together. We were coming together in circle to share our stories together. We would do one or two deep breath work sessions each day and, you know, started small, but by day two, three, four, like we're doing 60 minute we're doing 90 minute breath work, deep breath work sessions. I had never done anything past five, 10, 15 minutes before that. And I had only ever done it alone. And now you're in a group, sometimes with 20, sometimes with the larger group of 60 or 80 people and you're all breathing together. Um, there's this coherence that happens when you're breathing for a full hour in a group that large and you have instructors guiding you and you're completely focused and dialed in. And I have felt nothing like that before where you're traveling like time and space, you're levitating, you're, 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 you're having an out of body experience. There were times where I would have conversation with ancestors, ancestors whom I've never met, but I recognized in my heart that they were part of my family tree and they were passing along messages and, and then the 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 friend next to me was having a conversation with his unborn child who's still in the womb of his fiance back home we're coming out of these breathing sessions and we're in tears and our body's releasing all of this emotion and stored up trauma and it was such a healthy expression of both masculine and feminine energy, the way we were sharing together. And it was primarily men. It was maybe 80-20, 80% 80, 20, uh, 80 male, 20% female in attendance. But to be in a group of guys and, and come out and everybody's crying and hugging and holding each other and going, man, I got your back. I love you. I support you. We can get through this. It was something I had never experienced before either. So it was very, um, felt like we had found like, like, tribe a group that that was there no matter what okay so each day would have that component of sharing and breathing and then each day would have an adventure component at least once or twice like we're going to do something really hard we're going to do something that you might be afraid of we're going to do something that might be painful but you guys are all capable of it and we're going to teach you how to enter into those experiences how to connect with your breath because as Wim and the instructors would put it, um, pain, pain is gonna happen. Pain is a sensation. Pain is a message from your body. Your neurotransmitters are telling you, hey, this water is cold. You should probably get out, right? So pain is, is present, but suffering is optional. And so you're gonna feel the pain, but as you enter into the water and you connect with your breath, you can choose not to suffer from that pain. You can choose to get out of fight or flight, connect with the breath through the Wim Hof breathing. This is why I appreciate that you kicked off this call with the breath work as well. Like connect with the breath. And by doing that, you're telling your body you're okay, you're safe, you're going to be fine here. And then from day one, spending two or three minutes in those frigid waters to five to 10 minutes in a circle, in a group 
with one another, pushing beyond any boundary you thought that you had. Day one, I'm thinking, in, the voice in my mind is, you can't do this. You got to get out of this water right now. You, you're going to be the first one to bail. What are they going to think? It was all fear. It was all panic. And by the last day, when we're in the water with whim locked arm in arm, and we're all dipping under the water and we're breathing and we're 10 plus minutes in and we're hugging each other and celebrating that we accomplished this incredible thing together, you can't help but think, what other limitations have I put on myself in my life? Because if I can get through this, which I felt like my physical life was in danger, like where else am I holding myself back mentally, psychologically, spiritually, hell, you name it. And I can tell you on that flight back, you know, I opened up my journal and I'm like, I've got to capture all the, all that feeling, all those thoughts, everything that came up this week, that experience, I want to hold on to this forever. And I opened the journal and I'm on the flight back from uh, Prague to San Francisco. I've got, I've got 13, 14 hours hmm. and I'm just staring at the blank page. And I look out the window and I'm like, you, I can't put any of this down in writing. This was like an experience that I could not put down in words. I closed my journal and I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to feel this feeling yeah. the whole flight back. And that's what I did. Um, I did. I ended up getting a tattoo uh, to commemorate that trip. Um, that is a symbolic reminder of that feeling so I can tap into the essence of that when I look down. Um, What's the tattoo? It is, uh, it is a geometric sort of uh, rendition, but it, it's like the mountains that we climbed, the mountain, the physical mountain we climbed, the internal mountain within. Mm. And it's encircled in a circle with the sun. And the circle represents that sacred circle that we came together in out there and the circle of lifelong bonds and friendships that we forged. We are in touch constantly. We have been together since our small cohort um, because that, that's something that we went through together that, that just transcends and, and, and we know that we're sort of connected for life. Um, but I can send you, I can send you a picture of this as well. Oh yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. That is certainly quite the rite of passage. And I love what you mentioned there about having 14 hours, uh, on the flight home, opening up your journal and staring at the pages. I've been there a few times, just like actually yesterday I was there with a, a similar, but different type thing and just being like, Nope, not going to do it. Just be. And it's interesting because I work with the toad mess and Bufo so much and help people integrate and land with all sorts of plant and earth medicine ceremonies, but namely the toad. And that's one of the things I say most often, like try to be with it as opposed to create a story around it. It's so important to journal. Absolutely. Especially after these peak experiences, whether it's something that you shared or, or a plant earth medicine ceremony, whatever it is, but that doesn't need to happen right away. You know, it, it's about creating the space to just be in that feeling. So I'm so happy you brought that up because I, I, I could just only imagine what that would be like. Yeah, it was wild. It was wild. Yeah. But yeah, I just I allowed myself to sit with that feeling. And, you, you know, you're 30,000 feet up. You're looking out the window and you're just seeing beautiful vistas. And it was just something that, again, it, it felt like connecting to a deeper, more timeless, more ancient essence. It felt like, um, like connecting with our, our own humanity in a very primitive way through like, this is something that we have access to all of the time. This was a realization of you have access to your breath. You have access to the earth. You have access to uh, mother nature and putting yourself into uh, situations where you're stressing your system just enough that it's forcing you to grow and build resilience. And now this is something that I've tried to um, implement and integrate into my own parenting with my children. This is something that I've tried to integrate into the way I show up at work as well with my colleagues uh, in tech. 
um, there were so many learnings and lessons and growth that happened there. And, and that was certainly a peak experience, but um, one of several sort of peaks of, hey, this is the path I'm walking now. If I, merely, if I only open myself up, trust, uh, stay curious and surrender to where the universe is taking me, it, it's going to put me in this situ these situations where I'm being forced to grow. I'm being forced to grow. Um, uh, it, 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 they're not all easy. Some of them are tough, but it's just been beautiful. And it, it's completely changed the way that I look at my life and what the point and the purpose of this life is, you know, mm -hmm. um, which is now experience, um, live. The, the, I don't have to look for the big meaningful task the big meaningful job. I don't have to build a statue to myself. I don't have to validate myself in that grandiose way. It really takes the pressure off and simplifies things to this essence that I know now that you're here to live, man. Don't take it yeah. so seriously. Like be present and appreciate what's coming up, man, because it's all so fleeting. And again, I know it sounds kind of cliche and abstract sometimes. And some folks maybe who haven't gone through something like this may go, what the fuck is this guy talking about? But I know that in my heart that it could all be that simple if you just let go and just. Mm, I love it. Yeah, oh. yeah, yeah. You beat me to the punch on uh, integration part because it, it's, it's kind of like, uh, and so, and so what, right? What are we doing about it? So thank you for bringing that in. One of the pieces I want to highlight as well is this feeling that you're talking about when you transport back into the experience of seven days, was it a week in Poland with Wim? Yeah. So a week there and even the feelings you had on the flight home, you know, what comes up in me when I feel that in my body and the times that I felt that way and the way you're describing it is what the yogis would describe as samadhi. And in the eight limbs of yoga, like the asana, the postures is just one limb out of eight or branches in yoga. And all of these are sequential to get us to that final place of the eighth one, which isn't really an end destination, but it's like, you know, a sequential thing of that feeling of samadhi, which to me is like the oneness and just like that feeling of bliss, enlightenment. And it is fleeting for most of us. It's not going to be an ongoing state. But what this is about is, uh, not just manifestation, but like those times that we're feeling the anxiety, the stress, the depression, whatever it might be, the absolute overwhelm, the grief, the anger, the deep, deep, deep sadness, the guilt, the shame, all of these things. When we can go back to that place and close our eyes and feel it in our heart space of what it felt like on the plane for you, what it felt like to be out there, to look down at your your forearm, see that tattoo. I got my killer whales on my forearm from my yoga teacher training, very similar. And yeah, man, I mean, you know, just this morning in the steam room when I was going back and forth between the cold plunge and the steam room, I was transported to a few years ago when um, I used to always go on these walks with my dog and just a specific time. And I, I was literally there, you know, and th this is the place we manifest from when we feel it, not when we think about it, but when we feel it. And when, when you feel it, that's when you can manifest. So uh -huh. all of this has been absolutely incredible jason i really appreciate you coming on the show sharing your story in terms of where you're at now and you know it really all is so simple that as a download i come back to as well how are you moving through your life these days with uh, everything that you've shared thus far on this show yeah oh man great question because that is unfolding in real time hmm. um so let me know okay where i'm at now um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, I had a chance to get out to Rocky Mountain National Park and then, and then my wife joined me a, in Sedona. And these are two places that I had never been before. And I'm come, I've come to realize how important and how powerful and how healing being immersed in nature is for me at this stage in my life that I've entered. 
Um, so I put myself in those environments and opened myself. And, and the reason I'm mentioning this is because it's very much ties to where I am right now. A message. So as I'm in Sedona and my wife and I are, you know, sort of doing, we're doing hikes, but it's very much with this intention of being open to downloads, to synchronicities, to messages, to insights, to being open, open of, in the heart, open of the mind, and really trying to connect with the, the spiritual power of a place like Sedona, which when you're there, you, you feel it. it it's incredible. Yeah, and it's I awesome. love Sedona. It's omnivores. I'm like, it's incredible. While I was there, uh, I did a, a local uh, directed us to a medicine wheel and a labyrinth. And I very much tried to enter the medicine wheel, not as a tourist and taking photos, but like, let me really enter this um, with an open heart again and, and say my prayer to the universe, to God. And maybe if some, maybe something will come back. It doesn't have to. I just want to speak my thoughts, my truths, what I'm feeling and see what happens. And one of the messages that came through so clearly, and it really relates to where I'm walking now in life is, um, it was this message that came through very clearly that, you know, yes, you are deepening your spiritual practice. So it was very much there on that theme. Let me deepen my spiritual practice, right? It was like, wonderful. You're deepening your spiritual practice. Continue. And also, keep your feet firmly planted on the ground. Kept hearing this. Keep your feet firmly planted on the ground. And I thought to myself, and this speaks back to that, that integration, that soul life balance, that don't shun the physical material. And this is what I heard. It was, this is the gift. Your spirit, your soul has come here for this experience. And so while you may have those peak experiences, those moments where you feel the oneness, where you feel completely in tune with spirit and you're elevating and you're high in frequency, you know, also know that you're going to toggle and it's by design to toggle back. And each of those is fleeting and each of those is valuable and worthy in relation to one another and that's what makes this damn trip so cool mm -hmm. is that you can push forward in the spirit and also again keep your feet planted on the ground because this life experience and those emotions you mentioned earlier that full spectrum again by design your spirit wants to feel the the grief the sorrow the despair the sadness the anger the depression the happiness, the joy, the bliss, the whole thing, right? It's all part of this thing. Feel it all. Keep your feet on the ground. Because, hey, you've got some hats to wear. Like, you're a dad. You're a husband. You're a son. You're, you're in tech. You're, you know, you're a wellness. Whatever the things you, you think you are, sure, they don't define you, but go be those things. Like, play the game that is your life. So that was a major, major moment and download a message that came through. And the second one was, with all that said, don't take it so seriously. It was almost like laughing at me. I heard the laughter of the universe. And it kind of reminded me when you see, uh, like when, when you read or you watch these conversations with like these gurus or the Dalai Lama or Archbishop Desmond Tutu, and they're just giggling and you're like there's a lightheartedness there's a sense of humor that now i associate with these cats that are like enlightened or like vibrating high they almost just laugh at everything not laughing at but they can't help but just kind of have like a lightheartedness and i think that's kind of comes along with like not holding on too tightly but the universe delivered that loud and clear to me was live this life fully as this person, this character you are, but also don't take it too seriously. And I just remember glancing at my wife and like, okay, you're so right. So 
can I remind myself of that periodically when I do start to take some shit too seriously that is not that important, you know, the menial day-to-day, the mundane, the, you know, kids, you got to eat your breakfast, brush your teeth. Oh, I'm late for this meeting. Can you just remember, like similar to the tattoo of the experience, can you remember not to take any of this so seriously? Because again, yeah, before you know it, man. So that that's where I'm at now is constant is trying to remind myself of that. And that's just a few weeks old from that experience out in the desert. So yeah, thanks for asking that question because I love it's a good reminder to me to like crystallize that, you know? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Totally. No, I feel it, man. We are so similar in so many ways. I, I love it. Um, I, I am so stoked to just continue to connect with you. We haven't met in person yet for the listeners. And it's funny because you're in Silicon Valley. That's where I grew up as well. I live in Santa Cruz, which is less than an hour away, but um, I'm sure that time will come. Thank you, Jason, so much for coming on the show. And for anyone that wants to go deeper with Jason, I have uh, his LinkedIn and his website linked in the show notes. So be sure to reach out to him. He's an amazing dude. Jason, thank you so much. Appreciate your time. Thank you, Sam. I appreciate you and, and everything that you do and for having me on. And we will most definitely, God willing, get together in real life, man. Yeah, brother. All right, Sam. Take care. You too. 